Good morning. How are we doing today? My name is Paul Kautza. I'm the Director of Education for the Data Warehousing Institute. And I'd like to welcome you to our Orlando conference on Emerging Technologies for 2012. Um, I just got a couple of, uh, of housekeeping things for you. Um, tomorrow, breakfast will be back in the atrium where we had it yesterday morning for those of you who are around. Um, and the classes will start at 8 o'clock tomorrow, okay? Um, other thing is, uh, right after class this evening, we've got uh, three case studies uh, uh, to, uh, and I'm not sure exactly what room they're in, but uh, there'll be signage. So right after class tonight, you'll see uh, uh, case studies that you'll be able to go to. And also, we're trying something new this, uh, for this conference. Uh, it's called Live from Orlando through TDWI. Uh, so if you, you can go to our page at tdwi.org forward slash live and we'll have uh, tweets and videos and photos posted out there. And if you want to tweet, just use hash TDWI in your tweets, and it'll show up on the live page, and you can follow what's happening at the conference. It's got the schedules and all the things that are out there. So um, we're trying at this time to see how it works, and we'd love some feedback from you and, and see what happens with it. Uh, but uh, as director of education, my responsibility, primary responsibility is to uh, plan all of the classes and instructors that you have throughout the week. So if there's a, uh, I'd like feedback from you guys, good, bad, or indifferent about how things are going. So I'd, I'd, I'd appreciate that feedback. So uh, how many of you are here for five or six days? Okay, look around at each other because one of the th key things about being at a conference like this, outside of the class time, is the networking is to be able to meet people in your profession, in your industry, and spend some time networking with them, get to know them, find out how they're solving issues and solving problems that you may have that they've already solved. So um, it's going to be a little bit of, of a grind. So when I'm up here on Thursday and into keynote, I'd like to do all down here bright and early and ready to go. I know it, that, that gets a little late, but uh, uh, I think you'll have a great week. We've got a great lineup of classes and instructors for you. So uh, with that, I'd like to introduce uh, this morning's keynote speaker. Mark Madsen. Um, the only issue I have is that I had Mark's bio all set, uh, and about 15, 20 minutes ago, it just disappeared, and I got this. It says, uh, now I'd like to introduce a man who is clever and witty, and I could go on, but you know, Mark, I'm really having a real hard time reading your handwriting. So uh, Mark spent most of the last 20 years in one part or another of the BI field that we used to call decision support back when people were excited about languages like Prolog and Lisp, and artificial intelligence was a valid, considered a valid field. And th we all thought that 33 megahertz chips were fast. Advances in technology are making the BI environment much more complex today than it ever has been in the past. To navigate the path through the tools and practices means looking at where BI is headed as well as where it has been, and focusing more on the people than technology. Now, Mark doesn't want anybody to make a fuss for him. He just would like you to treat him like you would any other great man. So with that, I'll give you Mark Madsen. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm not too intimidating. It's interesting because I'll be talking about behavioral neuroscience and cognitive science and psychology. And so everybody cleared out the front tables. Um, we were doing experiments in the bar last night, actually. Um, so I, I'm going to talk about where we are today with business intelligence based on where I was 20 years ago. And where I was 20 years ago was uh, sitting in a research lab. My office was next to a monkey lab uh, where we could peer through. At, unfortunately, it's not the monkey lab where they taught monkeys how to, do, uh, how to use money which uh, would have been really interesting because I could have been ripping them off constantly. So um, that's sort of what got me into BI was, was decision support and understanding how people use information to make decisions. Now I've spent a lot of time kicking around doing this sort of stuff, being a BI manager, being a consultant. And what I, uh, what I found was that uh, we, we lost sight of what we were doing originally. And now that the tools are mature enough and the market's mature enough and uh, things have settled, we are being faced with a whole new explosion of technologies driven by 
the hardware world, the software world, but also because organizations have been using these things for 10 to 20 years and have a level of organizational maturity that's allowing them to go beyond just taking a report. So really, this presentation starts where the reports end. Um, now, this stuff's old. In, in intelligence terms, it's actually about 1958, if you go to HP Lund, and you look at this definition about looking at facts and apprehending interrelationships and goal direction. You have a goal and you're trying to use information to resolve that goal. And you know, this was really you know, the, still the Taylor era of industrial organizational design and hierarchies. The first paper on data warehousing and data warehouse architecture was Devlin and Murphy in 1988 that sort of codified it. And it's been around for a long time, but this really is the architecture that we use today. And it's a good paper. You can, uh, you can search online. There's been a few people, including Barry, who've made it available. Otherwise, it's behind the IBM paywall. Now, what is interesting about this to me is going back and revisiting it recently. There's three things on this architecture that do not exist inside of a data warehouse. Uh, architecture that you would see in a lot of books today. One is this box labeled business process definitions. Uh, all that processy stuff about who does what where, what resources are deployed against those things. That kind of information that really links data to process is missing. We abstract data away from process and we lose the flows of information and the timing of the flows of information and sequencing of actions and dependencies and feedback cycles. And so we have to reconstruct that at a reporting layer. Uh, there's a really interesting thing on the side, public versus private data. It actually encapsulated the idea that there would be data that individual people might have that other people wouldn't have or that departments would have but that wouldn't be available to the whole organization and that you would be able to access both of these things, public and private, personal and shared. And then we have the connection to both BI and operational systems. So what we have is the ability to both take in the information, look at it, analyze it, and do things through this intelligent workstation, which has a connection that reaches all the way around back to the transaction processing systems to enable you to act, not just look at information. And this artificial separation didn't exist in the original architectures. Now my career in what we would call BI started in the 80s. And in the 80s, my job was uh, working as a programmer in a company that took nine track tapes from hospitals, ran them into a private mainframe, processed the data overnight, printed out green bar burst reports, loaded those reports into boxes, put them onto trucks, and shipped them out at 5 a.m. the next morning. How far we've come. If you look at what we do today, most of us are running systems that batch load data at night, prep everything, shove it into a database, and then they put the green bar on a screen or in a browser or now with the mobile hype on a cell phone. So what we've done is we've reapplied the same metaphors and the same models over and over again. And in reality, the architecture for what we've done technologically hasn't changed that much. This is an old application. Now, it was at that time, say in the 80s, early 90s, even up through the late 90s, pretty difficult and expensive and complicated. And it required this whole technical priesthood of DBAs and ETL people and others. And that's one of the things that changes today. We still build it that way, but a lot of people are able now to do it departmentally, to do it individually, to make end runs around a lot of the infrastructure that we're putting into place. And we're at risk of actually falling behind them. BI is, in some organizations, a bad word because it has connotations of slow and three months to get my data because of the time it takes to go from source through ETL into a schema design, into metadata layers, into BI tools. So we have this potential for becoming the new mainframe, which I personally would like to avoid. So really, if we look at business intelligence as a capability, which is how Dresner from Gartner a long time ago defined it, as, as concepts and, and methods to improve decision making, which is back to decision support, which we used to use then as the term. Um, it's really using data to make, oops, it's using data to make decisions. 
Now, we think of BI as publishing. It's a broken metaphor. And the reason that this is a broken metaphor is that that assumes that you have to send the information into some central facility, you guys do all of this work, and then you give them a newspaper at the end of it. And really, the, this model of publishing, of doing all of the work, design, construction, gather requirements, do everything, and then give it to them, isn't the right model. It's an interactive model where we need to get more people out of the loop and avoid the publishing metaphors, because that assumes also that it's the end of the line. This is where you stop. Your job is done as BI professionals when the report goes out the door. And that's not true. One of the reasons people get frustrated is that there's a lot of difficulty still with navigating information spaces and using tools like your standard, say, Cognos or MicroStrategy or business objects. It's too hard for most people because in reality they only use it for 10 minutes a day at most. And so things need to be changed around and rethought in order to support what they do. And the other thing is that you're not giving them information. The real job is helping them solve some task-oriented problem that they're trying to deal with. That's a very different thing than delivering a report on a screen because you have to think about what they're really trying to accomplish. And what they're really trying to accomplish is decision making. And it might be very light decision making call center person who just gets a few contextual pieces of information and that's it. It could be highly complex, strategery, doing strategic planning, sitting down and sifting through all sorts of disparate information in a lot of different places, or it could be something somewhere in between. And that context and the motivations for that are really the interesting stuff. Now, I keep using the word decisions. And Decision means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Like if you go out and you look at complex event processing and people like that, you'll get one definition of decision, which seems like it should all be automated, just like report production is automated. And that's not true. Um, it's a lot of things, and that's just one range of decision making. So the, the simple formal definition I'll throw out to you is a choice between options in a situation involving uncertainty and risk that the outcome of that decision won't meet a particular goal that you have in mind. Basically, that goals drive decisions. Now, there's a lot of assumptions that we have when we think about decision making. Uh, there's, and, and these center around people. This is how you probably think about the problem. And these assumptions can be a challenge. Because when you have these assumptions, they implicitly frame, in cognitive science you'd call it a framing, a situation that might be different from the frame that the end user, that the person out there has. One of them is deliberation, and we all fall into this. You make a lot of assumptions about things, and then you act. It's how your brain works. But a lot of times, you attribute intent to others while expecting other people to realize that you did it by accident. And you should never attribute to intent or to malice that somebody did something that screwed you up what you can attribute to stupidity. Because there's that. And then never attribute to stupidity what you can attribute to laziness. Because in fact, people are on, on average pretty smart and they have good intentions, but they're lazy. And so if you take those as frames to work from, you design software to support those people differently. You don't dumb stuff down if people aren't dumb. You make it easier to use because they're probably lazy. Rationality, people make logical decisions, uh, logical and predictable decisions, which we're going to show that they don't. And finally, orderliness, that, that systems, the system in this term, meaning your organization processes, is understandable and the results of these actions are predictable, which if anybody's been paying attention to the news daily is pretty much not the case. So if we look at just some of the words in the definition, it's a choice a decision is driven by a goal, first of all. So you have some goal in mind, or you wouldn't be making a decision. So decision actually derives from goal. Now, goals are emotionally driven. They're not logical and rational. They come from fear or desire, which are actually two faces of the same thing. And it's the fear or desire for some outcome. Now, it might be you know, fear or desire that you'll lose your job. It might be something very distant, like the fact that if you make this decision, 
then you will meet quota, which means you will get your bonus and meet your objectives, which means you can go to Hawaii for your vacation in January. So your real goal is going to Hawaii for vacation in January, but it's very disconnected chain to what's actually motivating the person to do something. Now, uh, there, there's a lot of ways to look at that, but emotion is at the center of every single one of those. So when we look at rational decision making, um, you know, we have to look at things like what is rational, and a lot of people make gut feel decisions because we are all pattern matching entities. Your brain is basically a whole lot of Bayesian filters all stuffed together and interacting, and so intuition is really what your guess was if you were right, and bad data is what your guess was if you were wrong. And most people actually use BI systems in that fashion. You make a decision, and then you use the data to back up your decision. Or you use the data to prove why it was a good decision, so that next time when you make the same decision, it's a lot easier. But in reality, a lot of times, you're, you're post hoc rationalizing the decision and supporting it with data, hence decision support. Now, when I did decision support, we actually assumed that people wanted to be rational and logical. Logical and rational are actually two different things. And uh, it turns out that we were wrong. So we put tools in front of executives that would guide them through a structured decision by picking what's important and then solving the constraints for the importance of that thing and then giving you the optimal answer, the optimal choice between these three alternatives, like, for example, choosing a car. Now, based on what people say, everybody would be driving a black Volvo circa 1988 or 1989. Of course, nobody was driving a black Volvo back then because safety wasn't paramount. Red was the color, and sports cars was what people really wanted to drive. But when you told people that that's what they actually said, they said, well, your model is broken. That's not what I said because they're rationalizing about it after the fact. So we're looking at choice between options. You know, the options of, I can make this decision and it has these potential outcomes. I have this other decision and it has these potential outcomes. Now that choice and what drives that choice is actually the interesting bit about a lot of decision science, which is where you open up your head and start looking around and poking at things. Um, I've actually been in an fMRI machine having my brain poked at by researchers asking me strange sounding questions. Uh, but it was a long time ago, and things have gotten easier since then. And so there's a lot more of this going on. If you go out and search for neuromarketing or neuroeconomics, it's the latest buzzwords in the cog sci circles for applied cognitive science, trying to get you to buy crap you don't need. Now, scientific thought, of course, is the logical side of things, and sciencey thought is the emotional side of things. And you get all of these bizarre arguments that aren't really supportable, and you see them in newspapers chronically. The best way to have a laugh is just to look at the reasoning and the attribution of things in the stock market. It's up today because pork bellies are getting more expensive, or it's down today because it's cloudy in Florida. None of this stuff is ever connected to reality or makes any sense. The interesting thing is none of it's rational. Now, how do we know that none of it's rational? Because people like Antonio Damasio, um, did studies of people, in his case, he and a number of other researchers studied brain injuries to emotional centers of the brain, which in these people, they basically have no emotions. They are pretty much purely logical reasoning beings. And they have incredible decision impairment. They can't make decisions. They're purely logical, which would mean you're like Spock and you can do humane, inhumane feats of, of things, but it turns out that in fact, you're not, um, you're stuck because decisions are driven by emotions. So think about getting dressed in the morning. Which shirt do you pick out from the closet? What shoes do you wear? What socks do you wear? A lot of decisions being made to get dressed when your goal is to get dressed. So if you just take one decision like choosing out socks, these people couldn't pick out socks because which socks do I pick out? Does it matter? What things match? Does it matter? Not really. Most of us don't have a problem making that decision because it's an arbitrary decision and we see that it's not really a deep prioritization problem. But for them, every priority looks like every other priority because prioritizing things applies value judgments. Value judgments are emotional reasoning. Emotional reasoning comes from that part of the brain. When that part of the brain is broken, you can't pick out socks. So solution, just get white socks or just get black socks but they still have a problem with that. 
Which of these three socks makes the pair? You can sit for an hour trying to figure out rationally which of these two socks you should be putting on, and then thinking about which foot you should be putting each of those socks on. It could take all day. So you have to weigh pros and cons, and all of this stuff is of equal importance if you don't have emotions. So there is no way to prioritize and choose among outcomes. Emotion is a core thing in rational cognitive thought. Now, the other thing you think about is, is, is perfect memory. Well, I actually studied people with perfect memory, and the seminal case is this guy named Sherashevsky, who was known as the man with the perfect memory. He would go out on road shows, and he would, you could tell him anything, and then he would recite it back to you later, hours later. You could read him a passage. You could show him a page from a book, and he would remember it. He'd do it forwards. He'd do it backwards. He'd do it sideways. You could ask him if this one word occurred in a paragraph on page 36 of the book that you just showed him, and he would say yes or no. Now, the psychologist who studied him had a very long relationship with this man. And what's interesting is that storage and retrieval turns out to be a very small part of, of intelligence. It's a key part, but it's not the key part. And so, 15 years after he first met this man, he... The, the researcher sat down with him and asked him if he recalled his first meeting. And in his first meeting, he had read him a series of 30 numbers, which Sherashevsky, you know, gave back to him. Now, most of us couldn't recite 30 numbers. We could do seven. So he said, well, we were in your apartment. You were wearing a gray suit. You were sitting in a rocking chair. You were looking at a sheet of paper and reading numbers off of that paper to me. And the numbers were, and then he went through the 30 numbers. And this was 15 years after the fact. And yet this man could barely tie his shoes. Because it turns out that perfect memory gets in the way of a lot of things. You could not ask Sherashevsky to tell you what this short story meant. You couldn't ask him to summarize the plot of a movie. Because to summarize, you have to abstract. You have to lose detail. You have to aggregate. If you aggregate and lose detail, then you forget. You are essentially doing specifically engineered forgetting inside your brain. If your memory is perfect, it's actually a problem. There's a balance between retrieval, perfect retrieval, and usage of the information, and you need both of those things. So, you know, that's what we have. Now, the problem is that BI, right now, easily inundates people with too much data. Too much data is basically doing that to people and making it hard to abstract and get away from things and see details. And without that, you can't make inferences, you can't reason, and you have to step back. And so you end up drowning in information in much the same way that Cherashevsky can't summarize the gist of a story. Now, research, of course, says then that emotion is an important and core component of rational thought. Now, the other part of this decision-making is that there's some level of uncertainty and risk. That's what these choices are about. I have an option. I could do A or I could do B. A is cross against the light, and B is wait for the light to change. The trade-offs, risk of getting run over, being late for a meeting. So you can weigh these uncertainties and these risks, but your brain is terrible at this stuff. And you can go out and you can read all sorts of great things. Your brain is actually very good, though, at assembling all of them together. So it's not like we're purely irrational. It's that these are adaptively important rational effects. The artifacts of each individual mechanism seem to be irrational. So you have things like the endowment effect. If I give you $30, and then we flip a coin, and I will either give you $9 of its heads or take away $9 of its tails. Basically, you're going to get either $21 or $39. Or I can present you the same option in a different way. I can give you either $21 or $39, but first we're going to flip a coin. Which would you prefer we do? 70% of you will say, I want the first option. You give me the $30, and then you'll either give me another 9 or take it away, because you're operating on the delta values between these things, and because you have trouble reasoning over probabilities. Because these probabilities on the other side are exactly the same. But endowment effects, the stuff that you have is valued more than the stuff that you don't have, which is an explanation for the sunk cost fallacy of why projects that have been six months overdue and $2 million over budget get another million dollars and another six months while your BI project goes unfunded. 
Welcome to the world of SAP implementations. Um, prospect theory is related to this. This is a guy named Kahneman and another guy named Tversky who actually got the, the Nobel Prize for this, which interestingly enough was recently sort of semi-disproved. But prospect theory states that losses hurt more than gains feel good, which is kind of what I just told you with the coin flips. And brains are really bad at calculating odds and making these trade-offs. Now the interesting thing is that you're making these trade-offs of these options and decisions because of the outcome that you're after. So, so here's where we find out that the real thing behind most of this stuff, studying monkey brains and sticking people in fMRI machines, has nothing to do with psychology and everything to do with getting a date. Because it boils down to the fact that everything is about getting a date. So what do roller coasters and bridges have in common? Uh, misattribution and rationalization. So the Schachter-Singer hypothesis uh, is basically saying that uh, you will misattribute things that you are feeling, which is true every time you have an argument with your spouse, probably. Um, in this case, you're looking for cues in the environment to, to have an explanation of symptoms. So what they did is they got a bunch of men, young men, 20s, uh, typically, they experiment on people in college campuses, which is young men and women, and typically they're in the psychology department because they're the first people to see the sign-up sheet and make a quick 10 bucks. And so uh, psychologists experiment on each other, which explains the cruelty of most of the experiments. Now, one of the things, well, if you're in a publish and die academic environment, you know, the or die part becomes emphasized. Um, so two bridges. Bridge A is a nice safe bridge like this. And 50% of the men get to walk across a little safe bridge. It's five feet over this little stream, this little canyon in this hiking trail outside of, I think it was Vancouver. The other bridge is about 100 yards downstream. And it's way up in the air. It's about a 100 foot drop onto rocks down below. And it's a little bit rickety. And you, you send a guy down one or the other bridge. Now, the other thing that they did is that they put somebody at the other side with a clipboard, asked them a few questions, hand them a card that said, you know, here's my number, call me if you have any questions about this experiment afterwards, you know, and they would just ask them 10 questions, which actually they threw away. They didn't care about the answers to those questions. Uh, what they were really checking was whether the person with the clipboard, an attractive woman, uh, actually got any phone calls for dates. Uh, what they were looking for was to see whether they were taking cues on their physiological conditions. Because in fact, your brain looks around at stimuli and context. And then it takes the internal state of your body into account. And if your heart's beating fast, and your palms are sweaty, and you're a little bit nervous and shaking after crossing this scary 100 foot tall bridge over this, this canyon, your brain latches on to the last thing that it could find that would be a logical explanation for why you are shaking and have sweaty palms and are nervous. Well, that turns out to be the woman standing in front of you, rather than the scary bridge you just walked across. And so you must be attracted to this person or you wouldn't be feeling this way. And all of this happens subconsciously. You're not even aware of it, which is why these things about mindfulness and breathing and Buddhist meditation techniques are actually cognitively viable techniques for making better rational decisions. Because your body controls your brain without you knowing about it. Now, what they found was really interesting. Most of the men crossing the scary bridge uh, who called the woman, you know, actually called her out for a date, many fewer men crossing the other bridge called the same woman for a date. And then secondary to this was the rationalizations for why they did this afterwards. Now, um, in reality, most of these people you know, weren't really aware of what was going on in their bodies. Now, you would think that this wouldn't be the case because these are psychology students. Aren't they supposed to be studying this stuff? But in a profound turn of events, of course, most psychologists are completely unaware of their own mental states or anything going on in their own brains because this only applies to other people. So uh, the other one they did was they put people on roller coasters. This was a great study. Imagine you, know, you, you get to go and sit with, with your partner. This was couples. Uh, th this, by the way, would be a great couples therapy technique for any of you in sort of mental health care. Um, put a couple of people together who've been a couple for a while on a roller coaster and measure how much they're attracted to each other after the roller coaster ride. 
versus before the roller coaster ride. And you'll find that people afterwards are more attracted to their spouse than people beforehand. Um, same exact thing. But the interesting twist on this was why? Why are you more attracted? Well, it's the same thing, it's this misattribution of cues. When they asked people on the bridge studies, why did you call this person up, they gave all sorts of, of different explanations. Your brain is actually using your current mental state and then it is seeking backwards. It's called abduction. You know, we think about deductive reasoning, Descartes, I think, therefore I am, therefore I need a beer. Then you have, uh, you know, the other side of, of, of induction. You know, both of those things are saying if A then B or if A then probably B, logically, you know, or probabilistic reasoning. Abduction is B. Couple of states possible over here of A. What's the most likely A state? That's how your brain rationalizes a lot of decisions. So when you put a person in this situation of making a decision or attributing something to why they made this choice, most of the time they're actually going backwards to the cause. And they're assembling from a thread of bits of memory, because they don't have perfect memory, what it is that most likely led to that decision, and then they tell you. It's sort of the essence, if you read Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink, it's kind of what he's really talking about. There is the process of abduction that your brain is doing to give you the cause for the decision or the rationale for the decision. And the interesting thing which I learned early on, which got me out of decision, decision support, was that people don't know what the hell they're making decisions about most of the time, and none of us really realize this. And it's actually being exploited by marketers these days. Now, another thing is, is situation. In business intelligence, we don't think about the situation. Here's a dashboard, dash away. Here's a report. Now you have the data that you need to do whatever the hell it is that you do. Get off my back. Uh, that's why I got out of BI. I had no patience. Um, got out of BI, being a manager. It's much more fun to be on the other side. So um, the, the thing is that in a situation, it could be a complex situation. It could be a simple situation. It could be something that is very very orderly, it could be something with a lot of options. And the situation and how the situation is framed become important. Now if any of you ever saw the movie, a Kurosawa movie back in the, when was it, 50s? Um, called, it's based on a very old Japanese story called Rashomon. Rashomon is a story about a group of people who meet after a violent crime. And each person remembers the crime differently. And the interesting thing from a psychological standpoint is that each of these person's memories reconstructs the event in a different way based on the context of how they see the world. And that is exactly how your brain works. And so there's actually a lot to be learned from things like fiction. Now, the thing is how your brain works and, and all of that abduction, all these other things is driven by a goal. And so we're right back where we started. Goals and emotion drive decisions. And they proved aspects of this recently with some interesting studies. This is from a few years ago. Um, I love this quote, it's the particular part where they're talking about experimental subjects who are put in the situation of making choices, almost like gambling choices where you, you had to look at something where you had either a high or a low risk of winning or losing. And when you had that, you had different things light up in the brain based on how it was framed. By framing, I mean how you posed the situation to people. If I tell you that you're likely to save lives and you have about a, you know, say a 50% a chance of, of saving lives, or I tell other people they, you have a 50% chance of people dying. That's a positive frame versus a negative frame for the exact same probabilities, for the exact same decision, on the exact same data, for whatever data I give you. And yet, because of that bias in your brain where losses hurt more than gains feel good, you are more likely to follow a path, this is the prospect theory, of either risk seeking or risk aversion. Positive frame on a more unlikely event will still cause people to choose the higher risk option. I mean, this is all what you have with gambling and casinos. They're all based around things like this. So in this particular study, they were actually having people, you know, make a choice and press this button while they had them in the brain machine. Um, and people were actually aware of decisions they were making and they were saying things like, 
I knew this wasn't rational, but I just couldn't help myself. Your brain works in a particular way, and part of it has to do with the speed of thought. Because it turns out that the center that processes certain emotions kicks in one-tenth of a second approximately before reflective thought kicks in. So snap judgments are based on intuition and pattern matching. Rational reflective comes later. If you ask somebody to make a quick choice, that's what happens. The emotions kick in before, and they proved this. So basically, emotions always have the advantage in a decision-making scenario. Now, if we look at what happened in this particular study, the thing they found was that the amygdala is the, this place where negative emotions are processed. So think about some food that you've eaten in the past, and that food made you sick, or at least you think it made you sick, and we've probably all had that experience. That's being processed in the amygdala there, and you see that little circled area of highlighted stuff. If I give you a choice and I frame it negatively, that center is going to activate more. Now, if we go to the other side, when you're making a choice and the reflective part kicks in, you have this little war of the brains going on inside your head. And so, so I give you a keep or a lose kind of a choice, a gambling decision. And what you'll see is, is in conflict, there's two parts of the brain highlighted in that right picture. That's the, uh, the cingulate cortex where emotional conflict is being played out on the researcher's screens while they laugh and figure out even scarier things to throw at people. Now, um, that part where you've got positive emotions going on and, and things that are, are um, built around choice, those two things together will duke it out in your head to make that decision, and sometimes emotion wins and sometimes reflective thought wins. And the interesting thing that you can do to people during this phase is you can distract them. You can give people some task, remember this, and then have them do something. And they will lose the ability to control their impulses. So if you're asking somebody out for a date, make sure to ask them to remember your phone number and then ask them out for the date because then their brain will be so overloaded they'll say yes. Um, this is another aspect of using memory for, to your advantage. These problems, are, are all related to how your brain is processing. And um, when you are distracted, when you're in certain emotional frames of mind, you will make certain sets of decisions, tending to be probably on the risk-averse side if you're in a negative emotional state, and on a, a risk-taking side if you're in a positive emotional state. And if you're trying to creatively problem-solve during a crisis, or creatively problem-solve because you have different things going on, you really want to be in a positive frame of mind because a positive frame of mind leads to better association. A negative emotional state leads you to a very different situation where the apparent view of the number of options in a decision is very low. So all of this then affects BI because you're giving people data, but all of these other factors come into play. And the simple fact of how you frame a position or a decision or a goal if you have a very negative, we need to establish this strategy and do these things, because if we don't, we're going to go out of business. It's a very negative framing. You know, because it will all be wine and roses, well, it's a very positive framing. The positive versus the negative framing will change how people ac accept the risks inherent in change and change management. And so you actually have this very important thing around the words that you use. Now, I was going to do some priming experiments here, but we don't really have time. But priming is a scary thing whereby I can give you a list of words, and later I can make you do stuff. Um, you can look at those kinds of things on YouTube. They're really fun. Um, so what we've got then is we've got this going from this micro level, stuff happening in your brain, the fact that emotions tend to rule, but they don't trump everything. You know, if emotions trumped everything and you had no logic side to your brain, we'd all be dead. So all those books about irrationality and irrational thinking, they're great in as much as they explain how things work. But your brain, you are a very complex thing, composed of many parts. And evolutionary biology basically has all of these parts balancing out so that things work effectively in your head so that you're not constantly being run over by cars at intersections. You know, the, the, the Douglas Adams, uh, everybody tried to cross the road and got killed at the next zebra crossing. Um, 
So when we go from the micro to the macro, the thing is, a decision is not made in isolation. You're typically making these decisions, unlike the psychology studies, in an organization, in a corporation, or a government body, or whatever it is. And you're making it with other people. And you're acting, executing the decision through other people. And so even though that's irrational, in terms of how you might arrive at a lot of conclusions, it still works pretty well. But the nature of most organizations is groups, and this changes things, changes things a lot. So if we look at how we can use information to improve decision making, we have to focus on what the organization does. And interestingly, group dynamics and social psychology show you a lot of ways that you can dampen bad effects and make better decisions. You can also amplify innate decision making flaws and make things a lot worse. So let's just take some real high level basic decision theory stuff. I'm not going to do anything really deep here. Just, you know, you've, you've probably all seen this decision tree or, or hierarchy of who makes decisions. Well, strategic, tactical, and uh, operational decisions. Now, these kinds of decisions are, you know, strategic decisions are usually made at the executive ranks, tactical or managerial decisions in the middle, and a lot of operational day-to-day -day decisions about narrow scope things are, are made by other people. And so you have a hierarchy in an organization. Now the process aspect of decision making in an organization is what ties everybody together. So we have at the base level, people working process, taking orders, working in a call center, whatever it might be. They're doing things on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, something happens that they can't deal with. The irate customer on the phone, the order that disappeared into the bowels of the database never to be seen again. When that happens, it's outside the bounds of their process that they're working in. They have to escalate that. That's when they call in the supervisor. And the supervisor has somewhat broader of a scope. They can act within the process, but they can also grant exceptions to the process. This is where a lot of transaction processing meets complex event processing and decision automation. But the thing is, a lot of those exceptions, if you program them into a system, you end up in voice response hell, where you're screaming agent into the phone at United Airlines trying to get the damn thing to uh, get you to a person who can actually solve your problem, because otherwise you just go around in circles. Now, at some level, though, they have an exception, which isn't about the process that they control. The department or the division manager who controls this process can make decisions to change that process. But what if that process interacts with another department? Marketing to sales. Well, if that's the case, you have to have two people in there, and you have to make a decision about the trade-offs between Department A and Department B. If I change the process in this way, then all the salespeople have to type in a bunch of extra data. If I make it this way, they don't, but we don't get certain measurements that we need. So how do we make that decision, and what's the trade-off? And so a lot of the senior management to executive level is the optimization, the looking at multiple choices about processes and reconfiguring them. And so the scope of control is very broad, but not detailed at the top level, because they've abstracted and aggregated out. And it's very detailed, but very narrow down at the bottom, and it's, it's different in between. The nature of people's decisions on time scales, usually if you're talking about process reconfiguration strategy tactics and things like that, you're talking about weeks, months versus lower level. Um, the interesting thing is that down at the base level where you've got these lots of low value decisions, the aggregate value of lots of low value decisions can trump the single executive decision. Um, and then there's the fuzzy middle, middle ground in between. So when we look at that, you know, we, we also have this tension then. Down at the base, you want repeatability and stability. And you want to seek consistency, but you're not going to get that if you're constantly changing and reconfiguring things. Meanwhile, up at the top, you want change and you seek adaptation. And you know, in middle management, you've got sort of a tension between both. The problem is methods like Agile BI induce and react to change and dynamic situations. But they don't do well at codifying and making standard things at an operational level. BI and operations, the old models of data warehousing and architectures, make the base layer very stable, but they're resistant to change, and they take a long time to change. And so you have this 
different methodologies apply in different situational contexts for different architectures for different goals. And so you have to be able to extend and support both of these things. And if you look at how people act, down at the base layer, they're in front of a computer. Up at the top, they're picking up the phone. At the tactical layer, the managerial layer, where a lot of the, this stuff is really targeted, email and meetings and quick looks at you know, iPhone reports. So the realities of decision making are kind of ugly, right? It's a morass of interpretation of data, which is emotionally driven and pseudo-rational. And our tools don't necessarily support this stuff that well. So you know, things like convincing people to act is contextual. And the my data is better than your data arguments that crop up out of this. And, and all of the stuff that happens is around storytelling. Who can tell the best story around data is going to be the person who wins in the group decision. Story trumps data every time. Just watch election coverage. So how should you think about decisions? You know, what's a useful model? Instead of framing it around data, frame it around decisions. Now there's something called um, OODA, uh, which was, it, it's observe, orient, decide, and act, which was Boyd at Air Force, uh, who was in the Air Force, and was thinking about how pilots made decisions with lots of data and all kinds of things going on. Now this has been extended in the sense-making arena to figure out how you make sense of a lot of stuff. And this model is a really interesting model because in the observe side, you're thinking about looking at and gathering information, orienting yourself with that information to the world around you so that you can make a rational choice between a number of options and properly weigh the trade-offs. And then in the fourth box of the cycle, act, which changes things, might create new information, changes your orientation to the world around you, and the cycle starts again. And within each of those boxes, of course, within observe, there's a sense. You're foraging for information and making sense of it. You're trying to understand things. You're trying to select between options and make choices to decide. And then when you act, you're executing a decision, which means you're actually convincing other people to do stuff. Now think about how the BI tools and the infrastructure you've put into place align with how this works in an organizational decision-making cycle. And what you're presented with is Forrester and Gartner charts, things like this, which make absolutely no sense to me, because they're all built around categorizations of technology. This is about categorizations of decision-making and the situation in which you find yourself to make the decision, not data and not especially technology. And so when you see things like this that have web analytics mixed up with OLAP, mixed up with statistics, you know there's something wrong. Because something like web analytics is basically just BI reports against web data. It's not a totally different technology arena. So we need to focus what people do with data, not what they do um, with technology. And that decision making, and so you can think about it sort of like that OODA loop, but boil it down a little bit. Monitoring, this is what dashboards do and scorecards do, which highlight exceptions so that you know what to pay attention to. And then you analyze those exceptions using things like OLAP or other more detailed things. Now, you may find that there's no problem, or you may find that, yeah, there is a problem here, we need to deal with it, but we're not sure what the root cause is, so you go to causal analysis to figure out the root cause. It may be so complex you've got no clue, or it may be something really simple, in which case you fix the cause, you decide what to do, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that, I'm going to change the price of this product, I'm going to do whatever it is that I do, and then you're going to act, and that acts within the process, and you go back into your monitoring cycle. This is really great, you think about BI, it's reporting and queries, it's OLAP, it's statistics and data mining, it's decision automation and CEP, and those technologies align with this. So when you're looking at that universe of technologies out there, you can see that stuff. Now the danger with BI is that we've captured and made orderly the data in a very disorderly world. So the company is not a machine. That orderly world you have constructed out of data is actually a window onto that world, which may or may not be accurate. Feedback loops when you make decisions, nonlinear behaviors. If you keep doing something, it doesn't just keep going like this, eventually, it tails off or it feeds back on itself and you end up in a negative feedback loop which drives things down. So a lot of executives when presented with data and analytics 
think that they have a mechanical system for which you push a button and something happens, but an organization is not a car. An organization is a complex adaptive system where acting on the process changes the process which causes you to have to collect new data and create new measurements which may or may not be the right measurements. And so that's the process aspect that's really missing from business intelligence and closes the loop. And that's where a lot of the drive for analytics is coming from. It's understanding more complicated or complex situations and systems and processes, which creates new needs for data, new ways to store data, new methods to be more reactive with data, to be more proactive with data than simply reporting on it. And then, of course, ACT, the part that creates all the problems, because acting requires the ability to take that data and convince other people to change. And that's probably the single hardest part of more complex decisions. So you know, we've just gone through what people do with data. This kind of helps you think about it a little bit if they're describing things like ad hoc query, if they're explaining data visualization, modeling. Much of this stuff is done in Excel. Below that line, below number two, we're almost outside the realm of most classical franchise technology vendors and into the new stuff that you're charged at this conference for coming here and learning about and dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis and making technology choices. And as you move down through that stack, you find bits and pieces. And so a one-size-fits-all environment is probably not going to happen. Things are complex. What you really want to do is step back, put yourself in that other person's shoes, and think about it from the context of what they're doing. Because as these tools evolve and as this market evolves, you have to think like a designer. You have to think like the guy who designed the iPod. People want to listen to music, but they don't want this ridiculous complex thing. They want something really easy. They want things in the context of how they use them, on a bus, on a train, not sitting at a desk. They want things that work in concert with the situation that they are in, which might be sitting in a meeting. It might be sitting at a desk. It depends entirely on that person. And so it requires evaluating products and technologies that you put in front of people in the context of their work. And that means how they do things at work, which is making lots of decisions in our case. And so that's the mindset that you need to take, which is away from technology and data and from that, and then approach the problem from that perspective. And you might choose different tools or evaluate them in different ways or change the weighting of feature importance in these tools. So I just close with a, a quote from Fred Brooks that basically is, the swordsmith is successful whose clients die of old age. Basically, the job that you do and what you do for people is important, and that is design thinking. That's thinking about people from their perspective, not the IT and the data perspective. And that's a very hard thing to do. And that is probably the best framing that you can put around the situation that you find yourself in as a designer or an architect. So with that, uh, I am concluded. Thank you very much.